Hey, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Steve, and we just appreciate that you're making the time to join us for the weekly message for Connection Church. We are, uh, I think we're all just shaking our heads that November is almost gone, and it is almost Christmas time. Does that stress you out? Does that maybe excite you? Maybe, maybe it's not super exciting. Maybe it's not happy times because Christmas is just, ah, it means you got to hang out with family you don't really get along with. And it's tough to walk through this season where so many people are happy. Hey, we want to be praying for you. If, if this time of year is really a struggle for you, send us a message. We'd love to be praying for you at this time of year. Hey, we are wrapping up our message series, Great Expectations. How's it been for you? Again, I would love to be in the room with you to say, hey, what have, you, what have you pushed back on? What have you really embraced? What have you loved? What have you really not liked? What made you almost <laughs> shut off the message one week? Well, as we continue to just push into this, this section of scripture, we're just we're going to wrap things up this, with this section of scripture called the Beatitudes. So we've been talking about promises and expectations. They are so much a part of our everyday. We consciously choose a lot of them, but there are so many that we simply rely on without thinking. For some, the implications are massive because they call for so much of our time and energy and resources. Most of those ones we've thought about and we're actively choosing to set as priorities. But why? Have you asked that question at all during this series of the priorities and expectations and promises that you have in your life? Have you asked, why am I so devoted to this thing? Not because you shouldn't be to all of them, but maybe to a few. It's so easy to like, I don't know, just swim along with the rest of the crowd. But asking questions like, why am I so committed to this, this promise or expectation? Whether it's the promise of security, comfortability, success, pleasure, acceptance. There's so many. And we're saturated by a culture that has, a, that has different core values than that of a Jesus follower. Yet, it can be so easy, like I just mentioned, to just go with the flow. Have we taken the priorities in our lives, things that we're chasing for the payoff that we'll supposedly receive and have we placed them in front of God honestly asking him if they're where we should be pouring our time energy and resources don't be fooled God is interested in the things in your life even the small things maybe through this series you're thinking of the fact that maybe God doesn't God doesn't care about these small things that I'm chasing after I think he absolutely does. Not so that he can just control your life because he cares about you. He cares about the things that you seek. And he wants us to experience the kind of life that he's designed for us. So maybe it's not a reorientation of the seemingly major things when we look at the priorities, the promises and expectations in our life, but more of the subtle things that are or aren't already things that we're going after. Things that speak to our character and who we're becoming. What we've been looking at in this series really falls in line with that. Jesus is speaking of a set of promises, of expectations for Jesus followers that are not only things that we can lean on, but are things that should define the lives of Jesus followers. So if you 
if you claim that, if you're a Jesus follower, this list is not just a list of like amazing things that you can opt in for. It's a list of things that we should be opting in for and we get some pretty amazing promises and expectations through it. There are things that will not only affect what we do, but who we become. How much thought do you put in to who you're becoming? Like as far as your everyday type of stuff, does that factor in? Do you think of your everyday routines and think, how does this affect who I am becoming? And is that who I want to become? These are some huge questions and you actually can't answer them really well on your own. Neither can I. We have to have some people in our lives that we trust that are headed in the same direction who will speak honestly to us and say, I don't know that those things are helping you become who you're saying you want to become because the world, the world, if we lean in the way they're leaning in, And when I say that, I mean the people who aren't bought in to who Jesus is and haven't committed their lives to him. Those things that they're after aren't the things that Jesus followers should be after. Because those things that are determined by the world are far different from the one who determines the things that we should be after who created the world and each of us. Jesus followers need to care deeply about this list of Beatitudes because as we looked at in week one, we are to live life differently. I mean, it doesn't have to be completely different in every single way, but when someone takes a step back, our lives do need to look different in some way, shape, or form. And as we looked at, we're called to live a life that brings flavor and impact to wherever God has placed us. Maybe that terrifies you, but it's it's also so exciting because it means God's got something epic planned for each of us in all the areas that he's planted us. And as we'll look at today, as we wrap this series up, we're looking at a flavor and an impact that's to be life-changing in the lives of others. And the promise to us if we live this out, is nothing short of life-changing for us as well. Okay, I'm going to reread the section of scripture that we're looking at. should be familiar to you by now if you've been tracking with us. This is Matthew 5, starting in verse 1 and going to verse 16. This is the ESV translation. It says this, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, And taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I know you can read this and think, yikes, that does not necessarily end well. But that last section is what we're going to look at in our time together today. Before we get there, let me just pray. God, we just thank you so much that uh, we have your word. God, we're grateful that you desire to speak to us still through your word. You are anxious for us to live the full purposeful life that you have planned for us. But we fill our lives with just so many other things that call for our attention. And while they, some of them may not even be bad, they call us away from the good that you're calling us to. 
So God, help us as we wrap up this section, help us to just be open to what you want to say to us today about peacemaking as well as about being persecuted. So God, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so jumping right in. Man, again, I want to know what your thoughts are on peace. Where do you, what do you think of when you hear the word peace? Do you think of like a scenario, an environment, a location? I mean, one of the first places that I would think of is the cottage that we used to have. It was incredible, uh, especially just early on into the fall, like real late summer when the busyness of the lake really dies down, especially during the week. And people would maybe only come up on weekends as the summer sort of dwindles down and the cold weather starts to set in. And man, Monday mornings, Tuesday mornings, Wednesday mornings, we could sit on the dock and the lake, a good sized lake, would be just as calm as glass. It was peaceful, so peaceful. So when we think of peace, there's this element of calm. And the problem with our lives these days is we will often do anything, or I guess that's it's maybe an extreme statement. We'll do a lot of things just to get some calm where we can in our lives. Maybe this resonates with you because life is just nuts. And so when you can find some calm and peace somewhere, you do all that you can maybe just to experience that. And the problem is, so often to achieve peace, we ignore maybe the real issues just to get the peace. This isn't the peace that Jesus is speaking of here in verse 9 when he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So this isn't just people who live in peace. You know, the people who maybe retire out to the countryside and they are peacemakers. They live in peace. And when you're with people, they're just, they're the peacemakers. They calm everything down. They get people to refocus. This is not the kind of peacemaking that Jesus is talking about. But it is so much of the, the peace that our world goes after. It's, it's almost defined like, like it's just the absence of peace conflict. And so whatever we can do for the absence of conflict, maybe it's kids fighting and you just, you're at the end of your day and you're just like, what, what do you guys want? You, you just want ice cream. You want donuts. You want video games, whatever you want, take it just so that the house can be peaceful and quiet. I understand. I understand the longing for that. And sometimes the the soother kind of mentality we take to just have a situation be peaceful, but that's actually not the peacemaking that Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about bringing true peace to people. And that's not ignoring the issue. It's going to the root of issues. And this peacemaking essentially is evangelism. It's helping people achieve peace between man and God. And we see that true peace will really affect the, the, the lives of people and, and the landscape of our world. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says this. This is Paul speaking. He says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. This reconciliation that he speaks of is a bringing of peace. Through Christ, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So not only did we as Jesus followers receive this, this peace between us and God, but Jesus has given us that same ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting them, entrusting, sorry, to us, the message of reconciliation. 
Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so this is what Jesus is speaking of in verse 9 when he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, those who are bringing the, the ministry of reconciliation, bringing peace to between God and man. This is, this is a huge, huge thing. This is way beyond just like getting some peace and quiet in the house or, or between two people. And, and it's daunting because it means a whole lot more work. It does. It, it means so much more work and time and effort to actually see people experience the peace they can have in a relationship with God. But what better thing to help them in life, to help them experience and know the true peace that awaits them in a relationship with Jesus. It's so huge. And so this is the peacemaking that Jesus is speaking of. Blessed are the peacemakers. He says, for they shall be called sons of God. Family, children, girls, you're included too. This is huge, for they shall be called children, sons of God. This is, this is being brought into the family. We are taking on so much of the work that is similar to what Jesus was doing while he was here. And so, so he's saying, you will be part of the family. What an awesome, awesome thing to be considered part of God's family. Scripture says to us that those who are Jesus followers are, are heirs. Like, we're not, just, we're not just the, like, 12th cousin four times removed. Like, we are part of the immediate family of God, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of life, the one who raised Jesus from the dead. That's the family that Jesus followers belong to because we share the character and some responsibility of Jesus because we've accepted that free gift of salvation and we've said we will reorientate our lives around this and that means the mission that he's called us to to be peacemakers so what's the problem with peacemaking i mean there's a few things one of them is that it doesn't guarantee peace with others, which we'll see in the next few verses. It does reflect the character of those forever secured part of God's family. So while it brings some tension, what does this mean to you though? Have you thought about that? Does it really hit home that as a Jesus follower, you would be accepted into God's family? Does that change who you are and how you are? Not from a sense of arrogance by any means to think you're above anyone else, but that it, would, that it would humble you, that it would cause you to have a gratitude and a thankfulness to God that he would accept you into his family, that you would be willing to reorientate your life around his plan. And that is to help bring peace and reconciliation to those who don't yet know him. These Beatitudes are helping us become more like Jesus. And so that means we need to be up to the same kind of peacemaking he did. So as we mentioned, peacemaking doesn't always result in peace, though, for us. Verse 10 says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is a tricky one. For righteousness sake, for living in a way that reflects the gospel. Jesus is very careful not to just say, blessed are those who are persecuted. Because that could open things up to a way of living that's not aligned with what Jesus is calling us to. Unfortunately, there are far too many examples of this in the church throughout history. 
people who have stood on or in the church and done things that weren't reflective of the life Jesus calls us to. And then they get persecuted and they think, I must be doing what God's asked me to do because I'm being persecuted for my faith. Here's the thing though. We need to be about living in a way that reflects the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So it's where we honestly lay our lives, our decisions, our words, our thoughts before God, and we allow, we as Jesus followers, allow the Holy Spirit to convict us of what's right and what's wrong. We don't just go charging off on our own. Remember, all these things, these beatitudes, are not things that we can produce just in and of ourselves, right? So, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, that there would be a righteousness about our life. Remember, righteousness is not an elevated stance above somebody else. It's, it's all about what Jesus has paid for on the cross. It's that righteousness, that that would be the defining factor in our life, that that would be a difference in our life, that we would live in a, in a way that's reoriented around the person of Jesus, not just what the world speaks of. This also speaks to where our focus is in the midst of persecution. It so easily can be on say, the wrong that's being done to us or the person that's doing the wrong to us, the persecuting. But a focus on either of those things usually tends to get us off track. Whereas keeping our sights on the promise before us in living the way Jesus is calling us to live, even in the face of persecution, will keep us focused on what is good. And I I can't say something like that without thinking of Philippians 3, verse 12 to 14. It says this, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have, that I have already made it my own, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What do you focus on in the midst of persecution? In the midst of being teased or uh, nasty things said to you because of the faith you are trying to live out, because of maybe even the peace you are trying to bring to family members, friends, co-workers, the peace that is a relationship with Jesus. What do you focus on? Do you focus on just trying to make it through the moment? Do you focus on maybe you get sidetracked and you get frustrated and angry with God because why would he allow you to go through this rough time or season if you're just trying to help make him known. I almost think if we're going through a tough season in trying to make Jesus known, man, that's just a green light saying, yeah, you're on track. And that's not maybe the best news that you wanna hear, but the alternative, if we're free of persecution, if, if we're living our lives as Jesus followers and there's never any tension anywhere in our lives, are we, are the Beatitudes all that evident? I don't know. Because when we're reading this, it does seem to say that we will have some tension. We will have some persecution in our lives as we live our lives for Jesus. Which again is not something that is maybe on the little pamphlet to hand out to people to convince them to consider being a Jesus follower. But it is kind of encouraging to know that, hey, it's not unexpected. And if we focus on what God is calling us to, there's some pretty cool things awaiting for us. The kingdom of heaven. How incredible is that? 
It's pretty incredible that God desires to spend forever with us. And, and we'll see a little bit more of that in this next verse. But before we get there, I just want to say, like, we shouldn't necessarily go looking for persecution. But we should, we should be looking at the life we're living as a Jesus follower, if that's what you claim to be. Maybe even asking others on this journey, is my faith evident? And also asking them, how? Because if they're good friends, they'll probably say, oh yeah, you're doing great. But asking them a tangible question of how really put some specifics into it and just roll up your sleeves, get ready for maybe some tough responses, but those responses may be the best thing to help you grow in your life as a Jesus follower. All right. Verse 11 and 12, Jesus says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Man, this sounds amazing, doesn't it? Have you ever been reviled? <laughs> Have you been reviled lately? Listen, do you even know what the definition of reviled is? I, I mean, I had this idea that I kind of knew what it was loosely like, but I had to look it up. Check this out. Criticize in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. This is not good times, but maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've had those moments where you just feel like God is, is encouraging you, calling you out to say something to someone, family member, friend. You're nervous. You're not 100% sure what to say, but you step out in faith and you make a stand. And you tell them something that you feel like God has just put on your heart to tell them. And it does not go well. And see, the thing is, we're not guaranteed of peace as we are peacemakers. As I think Jesus is really intentionally following up the call to be peacemakers by saying, hey, hey, there's going to be some persecution. And, and it's very well going to be really intense. But something kind of cool is that this could have been a statement that Jesus was connecting with his disciples over as something that would also happen to him. Think about it. To be reviled and persecuted, to have all kinds of evil falsely said against him. I mean, it's, what's, it's what Jesus is going to walk through later in his life from from this point that he's speaking to his disciples. And I can't help but wonder, did that go through their head as they watched him be falsely accused and arrested and, and sentenced to death? There were, there were things that the disciples would walk through being accused of back then. And, and these, may have, these may be just normal to you right now, the ideas of communion and, and some of the feasts that, that we read about in scripture. But some of the disciples were accused of being cannibalists because the phrasing around communion that Jesus himself used was to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. That is messed up to someone who is unaware of what Jesus is talking about. So the disciples would gain some persecution over that. Some of the feasts, one of them was called a love feast. I mean, that turns some heads. That turns some heads these days, right? Gaining some persecution over some things that would just seem so normal to them. And, and Jesus' followers these days aren't without a list of things to get persecuted over. Well, Christians hate these people and these people and, and these things. Things, unfortunately, that might be true of some misguided Christians, but not the ones who are trying to live like Jesus did. And there will also be false accusations that are just false accusations. The enemy is going to stir the pot. 
and potentially have all kinds of people say and do all kinds of things against you just because you are trying to live like Jesus is calling you to live. So again, maybe you're thinking, it's not a good sales pitch right now. It's not a sales pitch, but it's the reality of the life of a Jesus follower. And I have to say, I appreciate Jesus being super blunt. There is no fine print in how Jesus lived his life and was calling others to do the same. In the midst of these wonderful times of persecution, Jesus says right in this verse, rejoice and be glad. It's probably not the first thing in any of our minds, but he's saying rejoice and be glad. And I can't help but think it's for a few reasons. One is because the time of persecution won't last. It won't, it won't last. And it will end with not only an eternity in heaven for Jesus followers, but also a reward. And if you looked at your life lately and thought, man, I deserve a reward. <laughs> I mean, maybe you have, maybe you've had a really great week and you do deserve like a little gold star or something, but probably none of us would stand before God and say, hey, where's my reward? I lived a pretty awesome life. But instead, God just, God just fills these promises with great expectations that we can hold on to as Jesus followers. That as we live a life that brings flavor and impact to those around us, as we bring peace, true peace, that brings life change to those who don't yet know him. Jesus says, yeah, it's going to be rough. It's going to be rough sometimes, but I want you to focus on what awaits you when your ministry on earth, when your life on earth comes to a close. You will not only get to spend your eternity in heaven, but great is your reward in heaven. How amazing is that? That he would hold for us a great reward. We don't deserve that, but he loves to give good gifts to his kids. I love that in this verse, he's also reminding us of something that's so key in the midst of persecution. And that's this, you're not alone. Persecution and um, people coming against you is so hard to take when you feel alone. It's probably the, the times we're most likely to give up is when we feel most alone. But man, sometimes, don't you know that it just takes one person standing beside you? That, that gives you the kind of courage to keep going. And while we can't see the prophets that are spoken of in this verse, to know that we're not the only one that's gone this road, that's had to endure persecution, is comforting. It's a reason to rejoice and be glad that not only great is our reward in heaven, but there's other people that have made it through. Here's the other thing that I think that's incredible about this last point. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. It's not just for what's been done to you, right? Because you're not saying, hey, I'm so fantastic that I'm persecuted. But it's what it represents. If we have our perspective about us, it's a changed life. If you're being persecuted, for living a life that mirrors the life of Jesus. You are living a divinely changed life. A life that you're not able to live on your own. The creator of the universe has given you his spirit to be able to stand up and take courage and say the things that he wants you to say to bring hope and purpose to others. That's a life of not only flavor, but of impact crazy. It's crazy. Promises are so often about what we do to get what we want, right? Think about the promises that you bank on, that you lean on in life. But here Jesus is talking about who we should be and that we will get what we won't, what we don't deserve. It's amazing. So as we walk away from this series, 
may you walk away with something. Honestly, take this section of scripture, reread it this week, and say to God, where do I need to lean in more and trust you with your promises? And where can I have great expectations as I live a life that reflects your son? And may we add some further consideration to the promises and expectations that fill our every day. May we realize that if we call ourselves Jesus followers, he's calling us to something greater than simply living like the rest of the world. He's calling us to a life of flavor and of impact, a life filled with purpose and hope, but also promises and great expectations. So what promises and expectations in your life do you need to lean on maybe less? And which ones from this section of scripture of Jesus speaking to his disciples do you need to lean on more? Let's pray. God, we again are so grateful for the love that you have for us that would cause you to send your son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for all our mistakes, all our selfish uh, desires and actions and thoughts and words, and that, that he would bring peace, that he would bring reconciliation to our relationship with you, that we would be able to live a changed life. And God, that you've given us your word that we can read to get to know you, to hear you speak to us, to be encouraged, but also to be warned. God, there is so much in your word. May we crave it. And may we look to you for the promises and great expectations in our lives. God, if there's anyone watching or listening that doesn't yet know that because they haven't fully surrendered their life to you, God, I just pray that now they would do that. They would say yes to you because they want the kind of life that you offer. God, I pray that they would let someone know so that they can gather other people around them to encourage them and to challenge them and to help see them grow. We are so grateful for who you are. We're thankful for, the, for Jesus and all that he has done and continues to do for us and the life of the Holy Spirit that is in every Jesus follower empowering us to live out things like the Beatitudes. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an awesome week. We'll see you soon.